We have a 2007 F-150 5.4 liter VIN V three valve engine. And the engine misfires badly, very badly. And sometimes the engine will stall because it's running so poorly at idle. Uh, the background information that this, this is an auction vehicle, which means we have really no history. The shop that I'm assisting when it first came in, it was running so poorly, they thought it was a restricted exhaust. So they dropped the converter at the manifold, but it had no impact on the engine. So they put it back up and they decided to do timing chains. So when they did the timing chains, they did the sprockets and the solenoids as well as the, uh, the tensioners and, and the guides. So they did a kind of a complete job, but unfortunately, engine's still doing the exact same thing that it was before. So the scan tool is connected. Uh, IDS provides vehicle information via the PCM. And as we progress, I'm sure you work on many of these engines, but for those of you that don't, uh, bank one on this engine is on the uh, passenger side and it includes cylinders one through four. Of course, bank two would be on the other side, including cylinders five through eight. Uh, one nice feature of the Ford IDS is a test they have that's called power balance. I've always thought it should be called a real-time misfire graphic because that's what it is. So in the box down here where my mouse is hovering, we have the current RPM of the engine, which is 660. That correlates to that zero green line that you see going from left to right in this trace. So that represents current RPM. And anything above or below that is RPM change. And then at the top of the screen, we have the cylinders in firing order sequence. If all eight cylinders were contributing equally, we would see a horizontal blue line kind of hanging above and below the green. As you look in this example, we have significant letter V-like drops. So cylinder number seven has a drop, cylinder six, cylinder five, and cylinder eight. This is telling us that all four cylinders on bank two, driver side, are misfiring. As the trace line, as the blue line travels from your left to right, it leaves gray. So the blue is current, the gray is historical. So here at idle, you can see pretty consistently bank two cylinders are misfiring. I'm gonna show you a few more screens of this. So here, you know, the engine's idling. And again, there's significant misfire activity uh, in seven, six, five, and eight. And you can see here in this particular screen that I saved, seven actually jumped up for a moment, but the majority of the trend is it points down. And I saw some unusual screens that I normally don't see on the IDS when I look at misfire, kind of a strange shape uh, in, in this case, but it's still the same four cylinders. And here's an even stranger looking shape. But the bottom line is, and even the bottom line, it is bank two. And even if I elevate the RPM, uh, bank two is missing. So I'm pretty confident the shop already knew this, but I need to know it for myself and for you. So bank two is definitely misfiring cylinders uh, five, six, seven, and eight. I take a look at cam data because I'm, I'm concerned, to you know, I want to make sure that the cams are indeed in the right position. So with the engine uh, idling, not well, these engines do not phase the cams. Once again, a 5.4, this 5.4 is a single overhead cam engine and these cams will, will retard as they phase. So I will be able to phase them in the bay. So right now they're currently at zero degrees, negative one, it's close enough to zero. So that tells me that they're in the right position. As I load the engine up a little bit, 1600 RPM, so not a lot, just a little bit of load, both cams retard about 44, 42 degrees. So they're definitely retarding. The maximum is 60, so they're, they're, they're moving pretty good. And I look at the duty cycle, command to the solenoids, 36, 37%, which indirectly says that I have reasonably good oil pressure bank to bank for this engine. So I load it up again. Again, the cams phase nicely. They're balanced. The duty cycle is balanced. And when I release, they go back to zero. I am confident it's not cam timing. I think the cams are in the right position. It's something else that's affecting bank two. As you see me done, do throughout this program, I'm resetting keep alive memory. I'm getting rid of those long terms. I'll look at, look at just the short term correction. So I fired a vehicle up. The long terms will be zero for a little while. RPM is very low. It's just an indication. This engine's running rough. It's having a hard time. It's having a hard time running. 
So my short terms are zero. You can see in a moment that's about to change. So that screen says one of four. I'm going to move my cursor to your right. So bank one that's not misfiring goes very positive. Bank two, which is misfiring, goes negative. I increase the RPM, and now I see significant corrections, but in opposite directions. Bank one that's not misfiring is a positive 27. Bank two that is misfiring is a negative 23%. I move it over a little bit more. I let it stabilize and reasonably amazing in that if you look at my trims, numerically, they're similar to each other. They're both around 24%. But one is positive and one is negative. And they don't always look like this. This is just kind of a lucky example, but they don't always look like this. But in this case, it, it is what it is. So one side of this engine is getting a very positive command, numerically the same as the other side, which is getting a very negative command. So this is, this is very interesting, this, this, this particular problem. So I'm not sure I can say one side's lean, one side's rich. There's something else going on here. I bring the engine back down to idle, and I just want to bring an important point here before I go any further. Obviously, we, we've talked about in this session using the mass airflow and our rule of thumb of one gram per liter above three liters. And this is a 5.4 liter. And not unlike the E250 that we just discussed, this is very high. It's 8.3 grams for 540 RPMs. So I'm thinking to myself, you know, is it overestimating air mass? And, and here's where I, I want to make my point. I'm not too worried about this. And the reason I'm not too worried about this is because this engine is running so poorly. Half the engine is misfiring badly. The PCM is struggling to keep this engine running. It's opening the throttle blade further to let more air and more fuel into this engine to keep it running. So the mass airflow sensor is higher than normal because this represents the PCM struggle to keep this running. So because of the opposing fuel trims, I know this is not a mass airflow sensor issue. So, but I do want to explain why I'm not concerned about the eight grams. It's because of the overall condition of the engine. So another Keep Alive Memory reset is done. I'm going to take you through these trims one more time, but I want to show you an interesting characteristic of Ford software that happened to show up in this particular engine. So the engine is completely warmed up now, running poorly. I did a Keep Alive, so my long terms are zeroed out, so we, the short terms will represent the entire correction and I'm easily duplicating what I showed you a moment ago. I've got the RPMs up a little bit, and bank one that doesn't misfire is a positive 24, bank two that does misfire is a negative 25. So they're very close to each other, very, very close to each other. And so I noticed something. As I'm doing my best to try to keep the RPM up there, bank one trims are trending downwards. You can see them, they're trending downwards. They're 6.6%. And I consider, I think to myself, this is pretty darn odd. But bank two is very negative. And then all of a sudden, and there's no change in the engine. There's no change in the feel or the tone of the engine. Still is running pretty darn bad. All of a sudden, look at my trims now. I just move them over and just look at them now. We've talked about this a number of times in this training program. So this, you're already, I'm sure you're already picked up on a clue. Look at my short terms. The numbers are both identical. And when I look at my fuel system, it's closed loop with a fault. The PCM is having difficulty controlling this engine. It's having difficulty with the fuel trims. And I've seen this before, and you may have seen this before on Ford products. So what it has done now is put in default values. So it's put in some values that do not represent any feedback based on the O2s. It's no longer listening to the O2s, so it's just, it's just throwing out some default values. And if you look at the traces or the graphs, especially in this area over here, and my scales are identical, bank one to bank two, even though this, these numbers, their numbers right now are at the same point, the numbers do move. You can definitely see the up and down on the curves, on the traces, but they move identical. It's as if the PCM is using one stored trim correction or strategy for both banks. So, it's, so this is 
This is one of these things that if, you're, if you weren't paying attention to all the data and the car's running bad and you're looking at the trims, you say, wow, it's really weird. The trims are not that bad, but this thing's in really rough shape. You have to look at that loop pit, the status pit. So this is a fault and the PCM has stepped in with some type of software strategy and it's just allowing both banks to follow whatever it believes is more appropriate. So interesting, some of the things that you can actually observe during significant uh, drivability issues. So this brings me to why do we have opposing fuel trims? You know, one reason for opposing fuel trims that you sometimes see is that someone by mistake has crisscrossed the oxygen sensors. That bank one has been plugged into bank two and bank two has been plugged into bank one. And that happens on some applications. But many times when that happens, uh, when the engine's in closed loop, the engine will run poorly, there may be significant surging, and then if the PCM decides for a moment to get out of closed loop and the back in open loop, engine runs fine. So when, sometimes when O2s are crisscrossed, the engine can run good, then the engine can run bad. But it can alternate. Here, in this application, this engine is running bad pretty much all the time with significant misfires. So this is due to something else. And this is due to an imbalance in airflow bank to bank. And I would like to take you just through a little bit discussion of this. And this is theoretical but I think it will help make my point as we consider what we are going to do next with this particular engine. So I have a hand-drawn V6. And this represents my mass airflow. That's my throttle blade. This is my engine with cylinder identification and some type of tubular exhaust manifold or header-like device. Imagine for a moment we're running down the road cruising on this V6 and I look over my scanner and I see 36 grams of air mass. At steady throttle. So I'm running down the road, steady throttle, and I see 36 grams. And I wonder to myself, is that 36 grams for each cylinder, or is that 36 grams for the overall engine? Well, of course you know it's for the engine. So I'm going to do a little bit of math here. I have six cylinders, presumably each pulling the same amount of air. While that may not be true completely, for our discussion we're going to go with that. So I'm going to continue and I'm going to say that, well, 36 grams of air mass for the entire engine divided by six cylinders, each cylinder is going to pull six grams of air. So now as you look at my cylinders, instead of having the identification number, this is the air mass. So each cylinder is pulling six grams of air. The PCM on a per bank basis provides the appropriate amount of fuel. We have good combustion and our trims should be very close to zero in the ideal world. As I look at my engine here, Let's just say that we have an issue. And my issue is that bank two on your left has an airflow restriction. And let's just go with something like a catalyst. The catalyst is, is restricted. Not completely plugged, but it's definitely restricted. Now, of course, to overcome that, a customer or you or I will just push deeper into the accelerator pedal. But let's just say for our conversation that our restriction in bank two is occurring with the fixed throttle. So our throttle blade a moment ago was in a position that allowed 36 grams of air mass. So the throttle blade position will stay unchanged and now I have a restriction. So I'm going to guesstimate that bank two will pull less air for the same throttle compared to bank one. And my guesstimate is I'm going to go with four grams of air mass instead of the original six that we had. So I'm going to reverse the math to try to figure out what the total incoming air mass is. Well, the good side is still getting six grams per cylinder. So three times six is 18. The bad side with reduced airflow because of the restriction of flow in the catalyst is getting three times four or 12. Well, 12 plus 18, of course, equals 30 grams. So the mass airflow now reports 30 grams of air mass. Unfortunately, the PCM doesn't know that there is a problem with bank two. So it does what it normally does, the 30 grams divided by the six cylinders. So in the next screen here, I'm going to have two numbers in my cylinder. The white is the actual airflow, and the black is what the PCM thinks. So if I have 30 grams of air mass divided by six cylinders, once again, each cylinder, theoretically, pulls five grams of air mass. So the black represents what the PCM thinks, the white represents what actually is flowing. So let's look at the good bank, the side that has no problem. The PCM will send fuel for five grams of air. 
Unfortunately, six grams of air is flowing on a per cylinder basis. This side will be lean. So the good side, the side that's got nothing wrong with it, is lean. I come over here to this side, the side that's got the problem. Once again, the PCM is sending fuel for five grams of air, but unfortunately, due to the problem, that side's only getting four grams. This side will be absolutely correct, it will be rich. So bank one, the good side will be lean. Bank two, the side with the problem will be rich, and the PCM will correct for that with trim. So the good side, which was lean, will get a positive correction, and the bad side, in this case, which happens to be rich, will get a negative correction. I want to make an important comment here before I leave this. Once upon a time, I used to say to myself that the side on a V engine with a mass airflow that was experiencing this behavior, that the negative side was always the side that was broke, and the positive side was always the side that was good. Well, there's nothing like experience and broken cars to teach us uh, what, how to really do things. And that's because that's how my experience was. But over the years now, I've run into situations where cams are advanced and the airflow actually goes positive. So this is a statement I would like to leave you with. When you are dealing with a V engine with a mass airflow and there's an imbalance in airflow, I think the safest, say, safest statement is this. The side with the positive trims are, is receiving more air mass than the side with the negative trims. Said another way, the side with the negative trims is receiving less air mass. So don't think about good and bad, just the positive trim side, more air is flowing, negative side, less air is flowing. I hope this example helps you understand why I believe there's an imbalance in airflow bank to bank. Reasons. Well, uh, restricted converter is one of them. Cam timing would be another. If engines have uh, intake manifold runner control like devices, uh, like spring-loaded butterfly valves. If one set of butterfly valves opens and one side does not open, that can also create an imbalance in airflow. But certainly, the heavy hitters tend to be cam timing and exhaust restrictions. And I'm pretty convinced, as I'm sure you are on this 5.4 liter, that it's not cam timing. So even though the shop has told me they dropped the catalyst, I'm still thinking there's something going on with the exhaust. So I'm gonna do the simplest things first. There's an old trick in our industry regarding restricted exhaust. And I'm gonna explain that trick in just a moment as we view this picture. Obviously, I'm looking at the air filter housing assembly, and specifically, I'm looking at the mass airflow sensor. And on this particular mass airflow sensor, it has an inlet air temp sensor as part of it. And I am going to monitor inlet air temp as I elevate the RPM over a period of time. On the IDS, the maximum recording time is two minutes, 120 seconds. That's I, I thought that was probably all that I needed to do this. So I'm just gonna sit in the vehicle, the hood is up, the hood is open, I'm sitting in the vehicle, I'm gonna bring the RPM up. And normally, as you do that, you know, the engine's idling, there's a lot of hot air in the engine compartment, but as you, if the hood's open and you elevate the RPM, the engine starts to draw fresh outside air in, and it, the inlet air temperature will normally drop down. It will, it, you know, it's cooler air, denser air is coming in, and it'll bring, it'll bring the temperature down. That's not what's happening here. So as I start my test at idle, 600 RPM, my inlet air is 116 degrees. I elevate the RPM. I bring the R's up. Two minutes later, two minutes later, after being elevated for a period of time, my temperature has gone from 116 to 129, and it doesn't look like it's gonna let up. While this is not a conclusive test, to me this suggests that indeed, this engine is having difficulty breathing. It's having difficulty getting the air out. And this, re this is, somehow it suggests, and I shouldn't say somehow, it kind of suggests that the converter could be restricted. So I wanna do what's simple first before I do what's a little bit more challenging. So what you see in front of you is a first look vacuum transducer. I have found in the back of the engine, I'm biased over here on the passenger side, a pretty good vacuum port centralized for the manifold, and I am going to take a look at cranking vacuum. So I want to see how the engine breathes, and, and my concern is that if I have an imbalance in airflow, this should show that to me. This should prove that to me. So I, my gut is that cam timing is good, I have an exhaust restriction, 
but I don't want to tell the shop to drop the catalyst a second time unless I feel very comfortable in my diagnosis. So I disable the engine, prevent it from starting. Blue is the number five ignition coil primary voltage. I could have easily chosen number one. I chose number five because frankly, it was close to my vacuum transducer. And green is my vacuum transducer output. This particular vacuum transducer is a differential type of device. So my scale over here on your right in green is zero. So I can't tell you how much pressure, nor can I tell you how much vacuum is in the intake manifold. All I'm showing you here are changes in pressure as I crank the engine over. So this represents the eight intake strokes on this eight cylinder engine. So my blue represents a reference, number five, number five, number five. So here I'm cranking the engine over and you're looking at a few uh, four plus four stroke cycles. And my goal is if you look at my green, you can see that whatever the heck is going on in the green, it's repeatable. And that's part of what I, what I, what I want to get at with this transducer, it's repeatable. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So now you're looking at two four stroke cycles. And clearly there seems to be an issue at the higher end of these vacuum pulses. So right there where I have my mouse, there, there, there. Four out of the eight. I'm gonna zoom in one more time, kind of show you the four stroke cycle. Now my goal here is to just verify who the oddballs are, who the odd ones are at. We have a pretty good guess, it's bank two, but I just need to make sure. So I'm going to use what's called an overlay, which is part of the, the picoscope, that's going to divide this pattern up into eight equal divisions using my blue number five coil primary firings as my reference points. The start of the four stroke cycle, the end of the four stroke cycle. So here come the overlays. And you can see they are marked at the bottom in the boxes, 90, 180, 270, in 90 degree increments for all eight cylinders. So what we are looking at in green, as the green pattern goes down, is an intake stroke. That's sometimes called an intake stroke pull. So I'm cranking the engine over, tend to give you better patterns. I'm cranking the engine over, and clearly all eight cylinders are pulling. So I have intake strokes at all eight. But on four of the eight, there appears to be a delay in getting that started. Like, like there's a little push towards the top. Once again, I can't really comment on how much pressure because this tool does not actually measure pressure, absolute or gauge. It's more about the difference in the pressure pulses. So I just like to identify who's who. Well, I chose the number five coil because frankly it was convenient for me. But I know that the number five intake stroke does not occur after the number five coil firing. And the number five intake stroke will be 360 crankshaft degrees away from the number five coil firing. And this is something you already know. If you think about the four stroke cycle, if you, if you watch my, my hands and my fists for just a moment, imagine for a moment my forearm is a rod and my fist is a piston. And I'm coming up on compression, I reach TDC, the rod swings, and then we would come down on power. Well, we generally fire the plug very close to TDC. I know it's a little bit before, but I'm just gonna kind of round close to TDC. 360 degrees later, that same piston is coming up on exhaust, top dead center, swinging to intake. So, so if I put two fists up here, as a piston comes up on compression, as a piston comes up on compression, 360 degrees later, it will come up on exhaust. As the compression goes to power, the exhaust will go to intake. So the intake stroke for your reference cylinder will always be 360 degrees away. So if you watch me count, these are 90 degree increments. 90, 180, 270, right there is 360. That piston would be a top dead center, a little bit to the right, I'm gonna put the number five, and then I can fill in the rest of the firing order. So clearly you can see that number seven, number six, number five, and number eight are different. They have a little bit more of a pulse than the other four cylinders. So I am reasonably convinced that there is indeed an exhaust path restriction on bank number two. This is an easy way to do this, and again, I'm not going into depth on the analysis, but rather just to say this is a quick way to verify that, that when my gut is telling me that there is indeed something wrong, and I think it's on the exhaust side. 
my final check, I'm going to take an insulin or pressure transducer, a Pico WPS, and I'm going to insert it into the cylinders uh, on bank two, uh, on my uh, passenger side. I'm sorry, my driver's side uh, bank two. So that's where I'm going to insert this. So I'm going to go in cylinder number five first. So you can see where I'm located. So this is number five cranking. And there's my zero. And my pressure hits, uh, you know, well over 180 PSI, reasonably healthy. But if you look over here where I have my exhaust stroke, there's my zero. And normally as you crank an engine over, you know, if the piston comes up an exhaust and you open an exhaust valve and there's no restriction of flow, we should be pretty close to zero PSI. I am hitting 4.6 PSI. If I vertically zoom and enhance this, take a look at my zero is. That's where I expect my exhaust stroke to occur. I expect it to be here. So I'm definitely, I have four PSI of back pressure on my exhaust stroke. If I fire up cylinder number five, I fire up the engine and look at inside the cylinder, my pressure is five PSI as I scale it. Now, if an exhaust restriction is causing this, right now at idle, as we know, I have low air mass five, five and a half grams, maybe six grams. You know, I have low air mass in general. So if I have a restriction in the exhaust, that restriction will, will, will act worse as more air mass moves through the engine. So I'm going to elevate the RPM of the engine with my transducer still in cylinder number five. And surprisingly, surprisingly, I reach, at 3,000 RPM, I reach 50 PSI back pressure. It's a significant number. So without a doubt, without a doubt, that bank two converter is significantly restricted. So at idle, it wasn't too bad. Well, don't get me wrong, zero is preferable, so five PSI is pretty bad, but it's really bad as I try to move more air through the engine. And more out of curiosity than necessity, I go into cylinder number seven. And cylinder number seven, I only chose number seven because it's, you know, it's, it's further down uh, in, in the head, and it too at idle, you know, five at idle was well, I'll just go back. Five at idle was about five PSI. Seven at idle is almost nine PSI. So it's a little bit, a little bit higher. I'm not sure if that's because of cylinder placement or not. But the bottom line, what, what's occurred? So bank number two catalytic converter is restricted. So the goal in this case study was to talk about how an imbalance in airflow, bank to bank, due to a mechanical issue, could have been cam timing. Here it was restricting exhaust, causes the fuel trims to oppose. The side that goes positive is moving more air then the side that goes negative. In this case, the misfiring bank was negative and it was getting less air. That was in this case. That's it for this topic.